Uh, good morning. Welcome to another session with Ms. Stover. Today we're going to be talking about bonding. In particular, we're going to be talking about ionic bonding, the process of transferring electrons. We want to be able to understand how we can model ionic bonds and know what's going on with that. We want to be able to write the correct formula for all ionic bonds, and we want to be able to correctly name ionic bonds. So those are the things that we're going to be discussing in this particular uh, session. So first, ionic bonds. They're bonds that are formed by transferring electrons from one, one element to another. That means um, each element will need an octet after transferring electrons. So we, these are made up of a metal and non-metal ions. That means a cation and an anion. Now there's another thing called a polyatomic ion that we're going to be introducing a little bit later. Um, but polyatomic basically means exactly what it says. Poly meaning many, atomic meaning atom. So it's a many atomed ion. Um, and we'll get into those a little later and how we use those. Right now we're going to stick with binaries just for the meantime until we can get more information and get used to those. Okay, so a positive ion, a cation. Well, what happens? It's an atom that has lost one or more electrons. It has a positive charge. Why does it have a positive charge? Because we are minusing a minus charge. Remember, we're minusing a minus charge. That's probably the easiest way to remember that it's going to be positive. Minus a minus means positive mathematically. Okay, so forming a cation. So here we go. Here we have an atom. Notice how many valence electrons does it have? It has one valence electron. So if I gave you this electron configuration, what substance would this be? Yeah, it would be sodium, a 3s1. Very good. So what's going to happen to sodium if we take that electron away? Well, what's going to happen is we form the electron configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Now, it's still sodium because we didn't change the inside, but the outside is now changed. So what's missing? There's one electron missing. So that valence electron that we see right there, the um, black valence electron that is on the left, is no longer there on the right. So we see this valence electron here is no longer here because it's been given up to give sodium a plus one charge. So that's how a positive ion is formed. So how do we name positive cations or cations? Um, we use the name of the metal. Basically because Na is called sodium, we call Na plus the sodium ion. It's pretty simple. So cations get their own name with the ion at the end, sodium ion. So next, negative ions or anions. It's an atom that has gained one or more electrons. It's negatively charged because remember, we are adding a negative charge. So adding a minus means it's going to be minus overall. So if we can remember those little rules, we kind of, we kind of have the idea. So forming an anion, here we go. Here we have a substance. Notice it has... One, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons. Well, if I gave you this electron configuration, what substance would that be? You're right, it's oxygen. Oxygen, a 2s2, 2p4 means oxygen. So if oxygen is going to form um, an ion, what is it going to do? Well, oxygen, because it has six valence electrons, wants to gain two electrons. So it's going to get an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Well, in order to do that, oxygen had to have gained these two electrons to give it a negative two charge. So two electrons had to be added in order for that to happen. But that's basically how an anion forms. It somehow gains electrons from a source and it becomes complete. But remember, in the other way, the cation, this particular cation we chose, only lost one electron. This has to gain two electrons. So we have to remember the number of electrons lost and the number of electrons gained somehow make a difference in everything that we're going to be doing. So the naming of the anion. We use the name of the nonmetal, but we end it in I. So if you have a metallic, no, I'm sorry, an elemental anion, an elemental anion, it will always end in I. So we have O2 minus. We know that's the oxygen. We know that's oxygen. O is oxygen. But we don't call that oxygen. We call that the oxide ion. And there should be the word ion back here. We should have the word ion right here. So that should be the oxide ion. Okay? So let's see what happens really in real life because these things don't just get electrons from anywhere. So formula mania. We saw this uh, yesterday. And if you didn't see this yesterday, you will see it today in class. 
So we can see that we have a sodium and we have an oxide. Hey, those are the same two atoms that I was talking about earlier. What do we see? Well, we see sodium as a cation, and we see O, oxygen, is an anion. So that's pretty clear. What else do we see? We see O is double the size of Na. That means O's charge magnitude is double the magnitude of Na. So charge magnitude is the 2. So that's the charge magnitude. The negative tells me that it's the anion. So I'm looking at the magnitude. We've got a magnitude of 2. We've got a magnitude of 1. The opposite, plus and minus, are needed because we can't have a charge in the end. So what else do we see? We see that Na needs to lose 1 to get a positive 1 and that O needs to gain 2. So it says 1O is not enough. Why is 1O not enough? Well, if Na only loses one electron and O needs to gain two, then one Na is not enough for O because O won't be satisfied. So the Na is satisfied, but the O is not. So what needs to happen is we need to add two Na's. Now we have a situation where the two Na's complete the O's octet. Each Na now has an octet, and now the O has a completed octet. So that means we now have two elements with completed octets and everything is stable. So each Na will lose one to complete both of their octets. And then O will have a completed octet because it takes two from the two Na's, one from each. Okay? So how do we name this or how do we write the formula? Well, we write what we see. How many Na's did it take? It took two Na's. How many O's did it take? It took one. It took two Na's to complete the octet and the O, and it only took one O to complete the octets and the two Na's. So what do we call that? It's called sodium oxide. We just take the anion or the cation names and we put them together. So the Na plus ion is called sodium, and the O2 minus ion is called oxide, so we call it sodium oxide. Now there's another way to look at this because you won't have cards at home. You won't have these cards to use at home. You will only have them here. So we're trying to get you to understand what's happening with the cards and then move on from there. So if we do the same exact compound, but we use dot structure, let's see how that works. So there's Na. Na wants to lose an electron. There's O. O wants to gain two electrons. Well, what's going to happen? Na is going to lose one of its electrons to O. So because Na wants to lose an electron and O wants to gain electrons, Na will lose its electron to O. But there's a problem. If we look at this, we can see right now that Na is just fine. It has an octet, but O does not. Remember, when it's empty as a metal, it's got an octet because it's gone down to the lower, the next energy level. It's gone to the next guy. So what's going to happen here? Well, Na is stable, but O is not. So we have to do something about that. So what does O need? It needs another electron. So the source of the electrons that we have is Na. So there's what we started with, right? Now we add another Na. So a second Na is needed. So that Na is going to give its electron to the O as well. And we get this situation going on. So now both Na's and the O are stable. They all have an octet. You can see the O has an octet. There are eight. Na, because it has no electrons in its valence shell, now has an octet. It looks like neon. Everybody's satisfied. Well, how many Na's do we see? We see one, two Na's. How many O's? We see one O. So what's the formula? Na2O. Exactly the same thing that we just got. This is exactly the same process. It's all about making sure the charge magnitudes are equal but opposite. That's all we need to make sure. And everything that we do here, charge magnitudes are equal but opposite. And again, the name is sodium oxide. So let's try another one. Let's look at um, calcium that has two valence electrons. And let's see here, let me get and nitrogen that has five valence electrons. So what do we know about this? Well, we know that calcium wants to lose its valence electrons and nitrogen wants to gain. So calcium is going to lose this one and he's going to lose this one. And when he does that, he forms a plus two charge. But the problem is nitrogen is not full. 
So we have to come back to calcium. We can't get electrons from anything else but calcium at this point. So calcium gives away another electron to N. Well, the N is now satisfied, and it has a minus 3 charge. But the calcium is not. So now I need more N. I need another N to see what I can do to balance out. So here we go again. So the calcium gives away. So now we have a second calcium with the 2 plus charge, but you notice N, this N is not satisfied. This one is okay, but this one is not. So we need another source of positive, which is our calcium. So here's one, here's another, and now we have this calcium at a 2 plus, we have this nitrogen at a 3 minus. So what do we have here? Well, according to what I see, everybody's octeted, this guy's octeted, this guy's octeted, these three guys are octeted, so everybody's good with the octet. Now what do we need to know? Well, we have one, two, three calciums. So we know our formula is going to have Ca3. That little number means there are three calciums. And then we have one, two Ns. So that's N2. Now if we go back to what we learned before, the metal cation always gets the name of the metal. So Ca is called calcium. So we're going to call that calcium. And the anion, because it's an element, is going to end in I. So we had nitrogen. So that's going to be nitride. So calcium nitride is our answer there. Okay? So I think that you guys can do this. I think that this is something you can accomplish. So is an ionic compound electrically neutral or charged? Well, when we do all of this, we find out that it's electrically neutral. So when we have um, Ca2+, plus, Ca2+, plus, Ca2+, plus. if we add up those charges, 2+, plus, 2+, plus, and 2+, plus, that's a total of 6+. Plus. And then we have N3-, minus, N3-. Minus. I'm going back from the problem that I worked on just a minute ago. 3- minus plus 3- minus is 6-. Minus. When we add those two charges together, what do we get? We get a 0. So every compound that we'll ever do is going to have to be electrically neutral. If you look back at the Na and the O, the same thing happens. We have two Na's at a plus 1. That's a total of a plus 2. We have one O at a minus 2. That's a 0 charge. So ionic compounds are always electrically neutral. They must be neutral. They cannot be charged. And that's going to be key in what we're going to be doing as well. Okay? So a chemical formula is basically the representation of the kinds of numbers of atoms in a substance. We saw that. The Ca3N2. There were three Ca's and there were two N's. And so that's called the chemical formula. Now, the lowest unit of a chemical formula in an ionic compound, like the Ca3N2, is also known as a formula unit for an ionic compound only. This is only for an ionic compound. So this, this is for an ionic compound. Formula unit is the word that we use for the smallest whole number ratio of atoms in a compound. So the one that we just did, Na2O, that's the smallest number. That's the formula unit for sodium oxide. Ca3N2 is the formula unit for calcium nitride. KCl is the formula unit for potassium chloride. And MgCl2 is the formula unit for magnesium chloride. So it's just a little bit of a wordplay. Formula unit is for an ionic compound. We'll learn what a covalent compound is called a little bit later. So when we look at this, um, the formula unit is based on the fact that ions don't come as single formula units. They actually come in what we call lattice structures. And so this is a lattice structure of NaCl. And this is what sodium chloride would look like. We w very rarely would find one Na and one Cl by themselves. So, which ball represents the Na? Well, if we think about it, we can really figure that out because Na is going to be in the second energy level with its valence because it looks like Ne on the outside. Chlorine will be in the third, so chlorine should be bigger than Na. So the purple ball should represent, the blue or purple ball should represent the sodium, and the green ball should represent the chlorine. So one of these is a formula unit. The rest of it 
is just a, an example of the compound. But one NAC 